Good evening. We are about three minutes out from starting the webinar. Hello. Welcome to tonight's webinar on growing day neutral strawberries. My name is Deborah and I'm a volunteer at the Minnesota State Horticultural Society. If you are not a member of MSHS, now is a good time to join. Members receive not only our award winning magazine, but also discounts at nurseries and greenhouses, free webinars, and more. Your membership dollars allow us to bring great programming like this to all of you. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. You're attending the webinar today in listen only mode. So you'll be able to hear our presenter, but we cannot hear you. That way there won't be background noise. If you have questions for our presenter, you can type those in on the panel on the right side of your screen. We'll also be covering We'll be covering questions at the end of each section and at the end of the webinar. If you don't see the panel, look for an orange arrow in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Click on that arrow and the panel will pop out. And now please welcome today's speakers, Courtney Cheetah and Annie Claude. Courtney is the Community Outreach Manager here at MSHS. And Annie is a U of M extension educator specializing in fruit and vegetable production. Take it away. Thanks, Deborah. So this is Courtney. Um, and I am super excited to um, have this webinar be happening. Uh, I really, really love strawberries. Um, I've been I've had the luxury of being able to grow them for the last several years when I was working at the University of Minnesota with the student organic farm there. And uh, these are special, special strawberries. Like uh, most people in Minnesota are used to the uh, June strawberries. And these are strawberries that will take you from the middle of July through frost. And there's something kind of magical about that. Um, so I'm just gonna have us jump in. So our mission here at the Hort Society is to go cold climate gardeners through education, encouragement, and community. And this education mission is really near and dear to my heart. Um, I really love just sharing my experience growing things and getting people excited about new things. So Annie, do you want to talk to us about June bearing versus ever bearing? Yeah, that sounds good. So we wanted to start off with kind of the big picture. All right, what are we talking about here? And what is so special about de-neutral strawberries, like Courtney was saying? Well, if you've never grown these or experienced going to the farmer's market in August and buying strawberries, what this means is that de-neutral strawberries, like Courtney said before, they produce fruit for the entire season. Um, on the picture on the left, that is a traditional June bearing strawberry field. So the photo on the left, those are perennial plants. And uh, you can see a lot of straw there. They rely on straw. If you look at the picture on the right, that is a row of day neutral strawberry plants. And you see a lot of plastic and fabric there. We're going to be talking about that uh, later and addressing why some people use that system for growing these berries. June bearing strawberries, this is the same picture that you saw on the slide before. These are perennial and most people will grow the same plants for about three to five years before removing them. The reason is after about five years, they really start becoming unproductive. The patch tends to get weedy and you start getting really small berries. So anyway, they last up to five years and they're harvested pretty intensely for about three to four weeks in late June or early July. Um, the way that they spread and uh, fill in that row so nicely is through runners. And those are the little stems that you see extending from the plant, uh, kind of reaching out to the nearby soil to start a new plant nearby. And these are grown on straw, and then they're covered in straw over the winter to protect them, and then the straw is removed in the spring. 
Day-neutral strawberries, on the other hand, we don't grow these as perennials. We grow them as annuals, at least here in Minnesota. There are uh, some places in the U.S. where they can be grown for two seasons in a row, but we've tried that in Minnesota and it doesn't work so well usually. So we grow those as annuals and they're harvested for about 14 weeks from late June through October or um, however long you can keep that area warm without letting it get too frosted over. So I've even seen day neutral strawberries being produced into November. We remove the plants in the fall once they're done producing. Um, we treat them like annual vegetables in the sense that at the end of the fall we take them out of the garden, um, put them in your compost pile or however you dispose of your, uh, your garden waste, and we can grow them on mulch, either plastic mulch, landscape fabric, or straw, and we'll get more into that later. One thing that's really cool about these is the yields over the season are significantly higher than with June bearing strawberries. So, um, you know, up to like three times, four times higher yields than you would get with June bearing strawberries. And that yield is more spread out over the season. Um, growers are typically getting anywhere between half a pound to a pound per plant. So I just planted 13 day neutral strawberry plants in my garden today and I will be hopefully be getting up to 13 pounds of fruit off of those plants. And I would just add that the, the day neutrals are, um, they're not necessarily winter hardy here. They oftentimes can winter over. A lot of times you wanna replace them um, be, to keep them in check with the diseases that can run rampant with them and just the weed pressure as well. Um, so those are two reasons to think about replanting them. You can leave them in your garden. I've had them over winter. They don't yield as uh, heavily in subsequent years after that first year, but it can be done. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the varieties. So those of you who signed up early for this webinar uh, and you're getting, I actually threw them in the mail today. Uh, well, I gently mailed them. I didn't throw them. Uh, you got Elbion is one of the varieties that I sent you. Um, it is a really great one. It has really high yields. It has like nice large berries. It does need some pretty consistent watering um, and nutrition in, in the form of nitrogen. Uh, it's also pretty resistant to some of the um, diseases like verticillium wilt and Thytoptera crown rot, um, and it's got some resistance to anthracnose crown rot as well. Uh, seascape is another variety that I did not send you. Um, it is actually, you know, <laughs> it's so funny. They, they list it in the, the catalog as one of the top performers um, in the, the yield trials at the University of Minnesota. It was actually one of the lowest uh, performing ones, which is kind of funny. But it does usually start smaller and then typically increase in size throughout the season, which is kind of cool. And it does have a good flavor. EV2 is the other one that I'm sending you. Uh, it's easy to grow. It's high yielding. It's less sensitive to warmer temperatures, so it, it typically produces um, more evenly throughout the season. Uh, Albion, last year at least, it had a little bit slower of a start, but then it had a really strong finish compared to the EV2. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when you're watching them. That could happen again this year. It could have just been a fluke last year too, um, but that was definitely something that I noticed last year. Uh, Portola. This one is lighter in color. It should be harvested before it's fully red. Um, it's a really high yielding one and uh, it ripens just as early as EV2. It's a little bit um, more susceptible to leaf spot, which is why I did not send it to you um, because I've had a lot of issues with leaf spot with it in the past. Um, it was the highest yielding of the ones um, that were grown at the University of Minnesota. And it's got a little bit lower sugar compared to Alvion. Um, this one, I think, actually, when it gets almost past ripe, it gets really dark red. And um, my son really, really, he's always like, I want the dark red ones, mom, because I think they're the sweetest. Um, San Andreas is another one. It's a pretty consistent large berry. Uh, it's a little bit lighter red than most day neutrals. Uh, Cabrillo is actually one of the newest ones that is from the University of California. And it has a lot of disease resistance, which is probably why it's um, coming online right now. Annie, do you have anything to add about any of those varieties? Not that I can think of right now. I think you did a good job. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, the sources that we've found them, uh, Norse Farm is the, the place that, that we've consistently ordered them from uh, at the University of Minnesota. I know, Annie, you got them from Ag Resource. Yep. Uh, just looking around, 
on line two, um, Burpee and Johnny's also carry some of these day neutral varieties. And I would say that they're they're very reasonably in cost. Um, like, you know, $14 for 25 or uh, $40 for 100 plants, that kind of, um, you do have to like order at least 25. That's probably the, the challenge. Yeah, so I only wanted 12 for my space. And so I just emailed a couple of friends and said, hey, I have to get 25. Does anybody want to split this order with me? Um, and it was $7 flat rate shipping anyway. And so I just found a couple people who all wanted berries and we split 50. That's, that's the way I got around that. Excellent. Yeah, and that was kind of our, our theory too, is that we'd buy a bunch and then we could send them out for people to try this year. And then if they like them, they can order more next year. You wanna talk about bed prep? Oh, am I talking about bed prep? I can talk about bed prep because I just prepped a bed for these earlier today. <laughs> okay, so the picture that we're seeing here is obviously a pretty large bed. Um, I think it's a quarter acre field where they were planting day neutral strawberries out at the U of M Research Center in Wasika. And this was an organic field. Um, they were looking at best practices for growing day neutral strawberries organically, um, such as which mulch to use, uh, how to best use cover crops and um, low tunnels, which we'll get into later. But anyway, one of the first things that you see here that they're doing is creating raised soil beds. So not, you know, raised beds in wood, but just raised soil beds. And the idea behind that, at least one of the ideas behind that is the soil would be better drained since it's elevated above the rest of the soil. And hopefully it would be well-worked soil that's nice and fluffy. Um, these can be grown just in your regular garden bed, like your vegetable garden. And they can also be grown in a, you know, a, a raised bed with a wooden frame. Um, so today when I was putting mine in, I wanted just to put them in my regular vegetable garden because it already has a rabbit fence around it and a deer fence. And so I um, just used a shovel. I, I only have 12 plants. So my bed was uh, three feet wide by seven feet long, um, which is a little bigger than you need. But um, I just kind of used a shovel to create a raised bed and then put my landscape fabric mulch over it, which we'll get into later. Cool. All right, so when I talk about mulch, I just mentioned that I used landscape fabric to install my berry patch in my garden. Um, so the landscape fabric that I used is just uh, at garden centers, it's marketed as weed mat, um, like a mat for keeping out weeds. Uh, but hardier landscape fabric can be found as well. Landscape fabric is really nice uh, for using for this because it can last up to 10 years. Um, it also, you know, a lot of the time it's black, and so that's um, keeping in heat, and strawberries really like a little bit of extra heat. They don't like to be too cool, um, so keeping that environment around them where there's also no weed competition really supports their growth. The other option is to use plastic, and a lot of farmers who are growing day-neutral strawberries do choose to use plastic. Um, this fits well with their systems and their equipment. Um, a lot of veg annual vegetables are grown on, on plastic culture as well. So if that is an option for you, then that's something you can consider too. Straw can also be used as a mulch for day neutral strawberries, but there are a couple issues with this. One is that it keeps the soil cooler and this can become a problem. The second is that in um, university studies, they found that when growing day neutral strawberries in straw rather than landscape fabric or plastic, they consistently got the lowest yields uh, regardless of the variety. So if you're going for higher yields, which I am when I garden, I, I, I would use something other than straw. I think um, for a lot of gardeners, landscape fabric of some sort is going to be the easiest act to access. Great. Um, and irrigation is actually really important with these guys. Uh, they just, they're, they, they're a little bit on the thirsty side. Um, and so having a drip irrigation system is really recommended. Um, I was looking online at like Home Depot and found that the picture that's raised the, the raised bed drip watering system for maybe, I don't know, $25, $30. Um, it's, it's just nice to be able to set up a timer 
um, and be able to have that just automatically get watered. Um, very consistently see, usually I, I think last year I did it for either a, a half an hour to an hour um, every other day, just about. Um, and that seemed to work really well in terms of producing, uh, giving them enough moisture that they really produced well. Uh, a timer is also really recommended. You know, ideally these want one, one to two inches of water a week. Um, and so to give them that through the irrigation, um, it's gonna, you know, conserve water. Overhead watering this is is not, you know, recommended. Um, you more want to have the drip irrigation set up for these systems, just because they they are going to do the best under those conditions. Okay, so I'm going to try. We we tried this previously, and the the sound was not so great. So I'm just going to jump ahead to the point I want to show you uh, in this video. So this is uh, somebody from Nurse Farm that is. Uh, gonna plant and he's got this stick which his is kind of l-shaped yours is going to be like a wooden stake but basically you uh, push the roots down using that you wrap the you know the bottom inch of the the roots around the stake and you don't want to do that you don't want to make a big hole um, because when you do that you can create like an air gap around those roots instead you want to do just like he's doing where he's just taking and pushing those roots down in um, when it's right to the right level and then pulling it out. Um, and you can do that really well. I actually had to wait to get these wooden stakes for you because it's just such the perfect tool um, to do that. So so there's your wooden stake, <laughs> what it looks like. I like the video because it's nice and um, you know shows it in action, how to do it. Um, you do wanna maybe trim those roots before planting. I would probably trim maybe a half inch off of the, the bottom of them just to give them a fresh cut um, and then like I say, take about an inch of those roots, wrap them around the bottom edge of the wooden stick, and then just press it down in. Um, thinking about the level, you really want it to be just at the right level so that the crown is just above um, the, the soil. You don't want it too deep or too high. Um, and you, you want those roots going kind of straight down um, around the soil. So you don't want to have it, um, lots of air pockets in there that can actually cause the roots to, to not thrive. So. Spacing wise, um, typically you want to do about 12 inches between the, the plants. Um, if you're going to do a double row, you know, that you can use a bed that's maybe 30 inches um, wide, 30 inches to 36 inches wide with a double row where they're about 14 inches apart and offset is kind of my favorite way to do it. Um, I have this dibbler or had a roller dibbler at the farm that we use to mark those beds or mark the rows, um, but you can use that just as easily. Uh, you can eyeball it, you can get out a measuring tape, whatever works for you. Courtney, I was, um, if I can just yeah. comment or say a thought on um, your slides about planting, can you talk about why it's important that the roots are straight down instead of being bent? Yeah, it just makes for um, the best soil contact with the roots and they're they're just gonna be you know, the happiest <laughs> is my understanding. Okay, great. All right, so um, a few slides ago, I mentioned runners really quickly. And if anyone listening has already grown strawberries before, um, you probably know what runners are. So the picture on the lower right that you can see that strawberry plant that has um, a little stem just reaching out several inches into the middle of the row, and um, that's called a runner. And with uh, with June-bearing strawberries, the runners are what the plants use to spread and reproduce. So it'll send out that runner. That runner has, you know, a little leaf forming at the end of it. Um, when that make, makes contact with the soil, it'll actually put down roots and um, start forming new plants. So that's just one mechanism that some perennials, like strawberries, use to reproduce. Um, but day neutral strawberries, since we are growing them as an annual, we don't need them to reproduce. In fact, reproduction actually takes a lot of uh, energy. And so what we want them to do is instead of using that energy on um, spreading with runners, we want them to put that energy actually into the fruit. And so we recommend uh, that growers remove the runners from day neutral strawberries 
regularly throughout the season so that they're not stealing that energy from fruit production. Uh, on a garden scale, this isn't something that should be taking too much time. You know, if you're going out to harvest every day or every couple days, if you see a runner, just go ahead and pluck that off. Yeah, and with the, the flowers, um, with these guys, you want to actually pull, it's so painful. I know it's so painful, but you actually want to remove the flowers for about the first three weeks that they're flowering so that they have time and energy to put that energy, instead of putting it into early flowers and early fruits, they put it into the roots, into the foliage, and then that'll give them um, the energy to produce lots of fruit and berries through the whole season. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention that I forgot to mention earlier when I was talking about the varieties is that a lot of these varieties are actually patent protected. And so it's actually illegal to propagate them. So removing the runners is one way you can kind of ensure that you're not doing anything illegal there. Um, and I don't know that, you know, on a home scale, you're going to get in huge trouble, um, but you don't want to, you don't want to mess with that. Um, so if you, you plant them and you let them overwinter and they come back, great, you can keep them. Um, but you don't, you, you're not allowed to like, once you plant them, you're not allowed to move them essentially. Should we check in with Deborah for questions? We do have one question. Um, Barbara wants to know if the fruit of this particular type of plant is as delicate as the June bearers or as the, what she calls the regular Minnesota strawberries. an excellent question. As delicate in terms of um, in terms of how they can be damaged after harvest? Um, I, I assume so. Okay. I would say that it really varies a lot by variety um, with either June bearing or day neutral. But one of the things that breeders breed for uh, with strawberries is firmness. Um, so I guess the quality we, maybe the quality you're asking about is firmness. And so um, they have been bred for that. And so I, I think there is one of them, I can't remember which one it is, um, that is really, really soft and delicate, but definitely the varieties that Courtney sent out, I would not say are uh, very delicate. They're, they're definitely on the firmer side. Of course, if you, let them uh, get too ripe in the garden and harvest them, then that could be one um, reason why they might not be as firm if you let them stay out too long. Okay, and Jill would like you to repeat for how long you remove the first flowers? Three weeks is what's recommended. It's painful, but true. <laughs> and it really does make a big difference. Like I've played with that a little bit where like, oh, I've only done it for two weeks. And they, they just, it doesn't give them, they kind of lose steam in the middle of the summer and they need more time to regroup. Versus if you if you just remove the flowers for the first three weeks, um, you know, they will, they will start, uh, you know, producing and produce very consistently after that. And we didn't really talk about when to plant too. So I mailed them today. You should get them in the next couple of days. Uh, usually around May 15th is about when I was always shooting to plant them. So right now is the perfect time. Um, if you get them, when you get them, uh, if you can't plant them that day, put them in your refrigerator. They'll just be that much happier if they stay cool um, and they should be good. And if you notice a little bit of like kind of moldiness around them, that's pretty normal uh, when you, you know, ship strawberries in plastic like this. Uh, I wrapped the roots in a paper towel to keep them moist, but um, that's that's normal. Don't don't panic. Um, that can happen, but they will bounce back beautifully. Okay. Yeah, our last question is how many plants are they receiving? They're getting four. They're getting two of each of the two varieties. Okay. Whoops. Sorry. One more. Um, a question. Uh, Tim wants you to please review the staggered row system. Sure. So it's just basically an offset by 12 inches um, so that, you know, you're kind of doing a zigzag pattern. Um, I like that because I feel like it gives the plants a little bit extra room versus when you put them right across the row from each other. Um, it just gives them a little bit extra room to kind of get big and bushy. Okay, great. Thanks. That's everything. Okay. So next we're going to talk about some of these low tunnels. Um, this is the Du Bois low tunnel system. Uh, it's kind of 
the fancy commercial option and I just wanted to show it to you to inspire you as to to know what's out there. Um, it's kind of a retractable low tunnel so it's easy to get in and um, harvest the strawberries. Um, it has a couple of kind of unique components. Um, the, the, the bar hoop that goes in is kind of square shaped and it has these little um, loops at the bottom. It also has the kind of hook that goes over that loop. Um, and that loop also holds uh, elastic, like an elastic band um, around over it, which holds the plastic in place and makes it easy to be able to pull the sides up um, and down. Um, usually you have to anchor those with like a wooden stake. And then you also have a, a rubber coated um, hoop as well to hold that um, to kind of protect it and prevent lots of rubbing that can happen. And then you put the plastic over. The plastic that, that's kind of the standard for the Dubois system um, is actually perforated. So the sides of it have little tiny holes in them. Um, the top is, is solid, but the idea is that even when they're pulled down all the way, you get good airflow going through them. Um, but there are other options too. Um, Netting is another option. Netting can be good because it can keep out some of those pests. Um, the Rime and Agrabond, which is the kind of spun woven fabric, that's another option um, for keeping pests out and for protecting the strawberries. Or you could just use a regular plastic too. Um, the goal with covering them is really to uh, protect them from some of the insects to kind of create a good microclimate. Um, with the plastic especially, you're creating you know, a microclimate where the only water that's getting in is from the drip irrigation. Um, and so you have better control over the water. They're not going to get overwatered. Um, it's also preventing splash from happening when it does rain. Uh, other thoughts, Annie, on covering and why you would cover? I can think of uh, two other reasons. One of them is if they're covered, um, Courtney just said that prevents water splashing. And that's important because splashing water leads to plant diseases. And strawberries are susceptible to diseases. And so covering it, uh, organic farmers that I work with, they say that they love having them under covers because they don't deal with the diseases that they would otherwise. Um, I think one of the other things, depending on what type of row cover you use, it can extend the season. So if you're using um, like an agrabon or a netting a, or a floating row cover, um, you know, those I don't think would really extend your growing season. But if you use a plastic um, uh, over your low tunnel, then it really does keep that. Uh, area warmer in there and so once we start getting frost again in say October if you have that plastic over it you might be able to get another couple of weeks out of your berries that you wouldn't otherwise. I don't remember exactly which year it was but sometime in the last like three four years we had strawberries at Thanksgiving <laughs> like <laughs> frost was that late and we had I remember we had still had like you know fresh local organic strawberries at Thanksgiving it was amazing. And they were from the the low tunnel protecting them from any kind of frost happening so yeah it's important to note too though i think that um the tunnels are super useful but they're not a hundred percent necessary either um you know you can grow these outside of a tunnel it's just that the tunnels give a lot of benefits yeah and the one added benefit that we haven't mentioned is hail um, I know that we've had strawberries get a little bit of hail damage that weren't protected. Um, and so that's something to consider too. Yeah. All right, so another thing is pathways. So let's say you wanna go order a bunch more berries and um, maybe you have two or three rows of them. So then you wanna think about what are you gonna do in between for your pathways? And there are a few different options. Um, some of these would go for other crops you're growing in your garden too. Uh, so one is growing a cover crop in between your rows. And this is something where there's been a lot of research on it at University of Minnesota for a few years. They've been experimenting to see what's the best cover crop to grow in between their rows of day neutral strawberries. So that's one option. 
Um, the, uh, the benefits to that are soil health and bringing in pollinators and making it easy to walk in between your rows. Um, however, some people don't like having cover crops in between their rows because if you have cover crops, you probably have to start weed whacking them at some point. And that takes extra time and fuel. Um, so landscape fabric is another option. That's shown in the photo on the upper left. You can see that uh, to the left of the row. Uh, so landscape fabric is an option to use. Uh, plastic is another option. You can use straw in between your rows, of course, which is what I will be doing uh, in my garden, but I'm not using straw in the rows with the plants. Again, I'm using that, um, that weed mat landscape fabric. Um, another option is bare ground. So before I go to the next slide, um, I realized something that I didn't talk about when I was talking about bed prep. Um, you see on the the photo in the um, the upper left how that mat that row it's called a matted row. Um, it's like the soil is elevated up, and then there's plastic that seems to be tucked in on the sides of the row. And how you can do that in your garden, if let's say you want to uh, plant your berries on landscape fabric, you want to have that landscape fabric tucked in on the sides so that it doesn't blow away. And how you can do that on a garden scale is just shovel away some soil to make a trench around the area where you want to plant those berries and then put that landscape fabric uh, down so that you have enough that the edges of the fabric are falling down into that little trench and then you fill the trench back in with the soil so it's um, it's covering the the sides of the fabric and it's it's nice and snug in there so I just wanted to mention that quick and I was I was always a big fan of putting clover white Dutch clover in between my rows um, it was challenging to mow with the low tunnel system and the plastic, but um, I just, <laughs> I love clover. I can't help it. Uh, it's just, it has so many added benefits of fixing nitrogen and pollinator habitat, and you can walk on it when it's soaking wet and it's not gonna compact the soil. So there's my my little two cent plug for, for white Dutch clover. Okay, so, um... This one picture on the right, it's just kind of an extra that I wanted to include. Uh, the last option for your uh, inner row areas is bare ground. So if you have a vegetable garden and that's where you're putting your day neutrals, if you're used to have, have had to having bare ground between your plants, that's okay too. But make sure you don't have your plants actually planted on bare ground in the rows. Um, strawberries really don't like growing straight on the soil and they'll be dirty and susceptible to disease. So make sure if you're using bare ground, you're just using that between your rows, not in your rows. Um, but one question I wanted people to think about is why wouldn't you use wood chips between the rows? Uh, well, the reason for day neutrals is we're growing them as annuals. So if you use wood chips between your rows, they would have to be removed and replaced every year. So fertilizing um, these guys, I would say that if you have like a good healthy soil that has a good nutrient um, amount in it to begin with, you probably don't need to do too much fertilizing with them. Uh, if you have a depleted soil, you definitely want to think about adding fertilizer uh, to them. Um, even just a, a simple, you know, 10-10-10. Um, typically, you know, you'd add that a couple of weeks before planting. Um, or side dressing it after the fact. You can also do foliar um, fertilizers with that as well. This is one, uh, Ag Grand is a foliar one, is that right? Or a drip irrigation one, is that right, Annie? I don't use that particular product, so I'm not sure. Okay, I think that's one that went through the, the drip irrigation. Um, yeah, so it's something I'd probably just keep an eye on this first year. Um, if they seem like they're they're nutrient deficient, uh, if you have, you know, yellowing of leaves or something like that, then I would think about um, potentially doing like a foliar application. Um, I was my favorite thing to do with almost everything that I plant is to plant them uh, and at planting actually water them in really good with a diluted fish emulsion. Um, I found that that just reduced transplant shock for everything, including strawberries. So anything if somebody's yeah, if somebody's uh, going to their local garden center and they're wanting to find a foliar feed for strawberries, um, what are do you know what some of the key words are that people should look for? Because they wouldn't be going to the garden center and looking for that particular product on the the photo, right? That we're just using that as an example. Right, I would look for like a fish emulsion. Um, there's a bunch of different brands of it. There's Alaska. There's 
uh, I think Mike's or something like that has one. Um, Neptune's Harvest is another one. That are, those are all easy to apply as foliar sprays. Yeah. Okay, jumping into the pest. I'm gonna start out with the worst one. Hunted <laughs> wing drosophila. It's definitely the worst. Uh, strawberries, unfortunately, are susceptible. This is one of those reasons why you might want to think about putting kind of netting down. Um, that's pretty fine just to keep them out. Um, spotted wing drosophila, or SWD as it's uh, commonly referred to, is uh, nasty and that it's this you know little fruit fly that has a serrated ovipositor that'll actually lay its eggs in the ripening fruit. Uh, it's much, much worse in raspberries than it is in strawberries in my experience, but they can um, infect strawberries as well. Um, a lot of times when a strawberry is infected, when you go to har harvest it, it'll just be really, really soft. Um, and that's usually a sign that it's been, uh, you know, infected by the, the larva of the spotted wing drosophila. And in terms of like controlling it, um, you know, my, my tactic was always to go through and as I was harvesting it, have a bucket of soapy water. And if I find one, throw it in the, <laughs> the soapy water and let it sit there for at least 24 hours before I composted it to kill off the larva. Um, I know that neem is another option um, that can help kind of reduce it, but um, there, I don't know that there's a really great spray. Do you have any insight into that, Annie? So um, spinosad is available to home gardeners. Uh, there are a number of products um, that it's called, but spinosad is the, the generic name, and um, that's going to be pretty effective. The most effective product that commercial farmers are using is called Entrust, which is a spinosad. So if you can find a spinosad product, I would use that. Um, I've heard or I've read uh, research showing that neem oil is 25% effective. So I would say uh, as a home gardener, especially with strawberries, if you can go out there and harvest every day or every other day, I think uh, that's going to be one of the most effective methods rather than solely relying on a spray solution. Definitely. Yeah, we would harvest them three times a week. Um, at least just because that that's plus they're just ripening that fast. So you want to, you know, you yeah. want to harvest them while they're ripening. So, yeah. Uh, Japanese beetles are another one. They weren't so bad last year, but two years ago, this is a picture of the Japanese oh. beetles just defoliating, <laughs> uh, turning my, my poor strawberry plants into Swiss cheese. Uh, and my solution that year was actually, I went out and bought that <laughs> little hand vac. Uh, battery operated and I just sucked them all up and dumped them in uh, soapy water. Um, they're hard to catch. Um, it's best to do it kind of at early in the day and late in the day at kind of um, when they're less active. Um, but <laughs> a vacuum cleaner actually works best uh, in terms of controlling them. They're they're really hard to tricky in that like some years they're really, really thick and other years they're not so bad. Last year they weren't so bad. Um, this year with the winter we had, who knows what they'll be like. They do go in cycles, um, and some years they're they're worse than others. Um, they do they can you know attack strawberries, so keep an eye out for that too. Um, tarnished plant bug is another one that can really be a problem. Um, they have these kind of piercing, sucking mouth parts that feed on the flowers and the fruits, and they cause this kind of cat face um, damage to the strawberries. It, they still taste great. It, there's no like, you know, they're cosmetic. It's it's more of a, a appearance problem than anything else. Um, but they can, you know, make your strawberries not look quite so picture perfect. Um, and the best ways to kind of reduce those is to remove the leaf litter to reduce the, the overwintering sites for the tarnished plant bug. Um, you want to remove weeds as they can be habitat for the, the adults to feed in overwinter. You want to keep lawn areas mowed so that you don't have habitat for them. Um, you, you could also try like physically, you know, trapping them, uh, tapping the flowers to dislodge them into soapy water if you catch them. Um, and then, you know, you want to kind of, you know, growing them as an annual also really helps us because you don't have to um, worry about them overwintering and then being there in the same spot the next year. Aphids are another one that can be an issue with these strawberries. Um, there's all different kinds of, of aphids that are out there. Um, again, they have that kind of soft bodied sucking insect. Um, they can also spread diseases. There, the good news is there's lots of predators to aphids. 
um, you know, lace wings, ladybird bird beetles, uh, even a thrips and a cirripid fly. Um, and they actually, like those parasites can actually do a lot of control. So making sure that you have a lot of other flowers in your garden that have little tiny flowers can help create the habitat for a lot of these parasitic wasps um, and the parasitoids that will uh, help control the aphids for you. Um, slugs are another one that can um, be damaging to strawberries. They kind of lead a little uh, trail on the strawberry itself. Um, they um, just can be an issue. The, the best way that I've found to control them um, they seem to be the worst for you when you actually use the straw mulch, so not using the straw mulch can help. But then by um, either setting out a, a board or a newspaper that's wet, that'll actually, they'll be attracted to that and they'll go into that. There's also beer traps where you can put beer in the lids <laughs> and put those out in your garden and they'll go into the beer and, and die. Um, any other thoughts on any of those, those insects, Annie? Um, no, except I, so I used diatomaceous earth one year to control slugs because nice. they were just so bad. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so there are um, several different diseases that can impact strawberries. Um, the diseases that day neutral strawberries have are generally the same as the diseases that uh, regular June bearing strawberries get. And so three of them that I'll show pictures of today are botrytis gray mold, which uh, is that fuzzy mold that the fruit gets. The second one is powdery mildew, which is also a fuzzy mold on the fruit. And the third one I want to mention is leaf spot, which really only impacts the leaves. And I'm not going to go big into detail about the biology of these diseases or um, management for the different diseases because I know that information overload is a thing. And this information on managing these diseases is available online and there's really good resources for these. And so I'm just going to basically show you what a few of them look like. So that way you can keep an eye out for them. And if you see them, hopefully you remember, oh, you know, that that was in the presentation, that's botrytis, and you can go online and read more about how to control those, and it'll be most effective that way. So let's go to the next slide. This is what botrytis gray mold looks like, and you see that straw that's underneath those strawberries? Um, growing strawberries on straw or directly on the ground is one thing that diseases really love, and so when it rains, that those raindrops um, splash on the surface of the straw or the surface on the soil and the disease spores, the fungal spores, those are hanging out in the soil or in the straw or in the leaves on the ground. And so those splash up with raindrops and they fall on the fruit and that's how the fruit gets infected. So that's definitely the case with botrytis. So that's one of the reasons why we really recommend people growing these on something like a landscape fa fabric or a plastic. Um, the other thing is having those low tunnels like we talked about before, it prevents those raindrops from falling on the soil and splashing up because those plants are protected. So those are two ways you can uh, help prevent this from happening. This is what powdery mildew looks like. So you can see kind of a more subtle uh, fuzz on the fruit, but definitely still visible and you probably wouldn't want to eat the fruit that has that white fuzz all over it. Um, you can see symptoms on the leaves too. So if you start seeing your leaves kind of getting yellow and blotchy, powdery mildew could be something that's causing that. And so if you uh, want to figure out what it is, look under the bottom side of the leaf and you might be able to see some discoloration and fuzziness on the bottom side as well. But if you uh, if your leaves are turning yellow and you look at the bottom side and you don't really see uh, what's on the right there, then it, it could mean that it's something else, like a nutrient deficiency. All right, this the third one I wanted to mention is strawberry leaf spot. This is super, super common. Um, I've never been to a farm that didn't have strawberry leaf spot. And what this is, is just white spots on the leaves. Sometimes the spots can be kind of purple or brown, and they're outlined by 
purple, black, or brown coloring. And so this is just a, a bacteria, and it usually is just limited to the leaves. Um, it doesn't really impact the fruit. Um, the, the way it could impact the fruit indirectly is if leaf spot starts getting extremely bad, then it could cause the leaves to shrivel and die, and then it could impact your yield because the plants aren't photosynthesizing as well. But it's rare that it gets that bad. So it's usually just cosmetic. Um, if you're planting strawberries multiple years in a row though, uh, you would want to rotate your the location of your strawberry so this disease doesn't accumulate in the soil. Okay, so I mentioned a couple of these before, but some tips for reducing strawberry diseases in general. The first is to plant in well-drained soil. Uh, so diseases really, really love wet conditions. Uh, plants typically do not. <laughs> so um, doing you know, that mounded raised bed, planting in a wooden raised bed, or just planting in um, well-drained soil, you know, you can grow these in containers as well. Uh, so, you know, you're getting four plants, maybe you have a, a small planter that you can put those in. So um, planting them in well-drained soil is important. Planting in full sunlight, you don't want them to be shaded. Rotate, so change the locations of your strawberries each year, especially if you're doing day neutrals. Use low tunnel row covers like Courtney was talking about before because that prevents rain droplets from getting in. Um, this isn't, you know, I know that's not possible for everybody, but it is one way that you can reduce strawberry disease and use drip irrigation instead of overhead watering like Courtney was talking about, if possible. So um, our extension website, because I work for extension, our extension website has some really good information on growing strawberries, um, day neutrals, and June bearing. So if you go there, there's um, a big section about strawberry diseases where you can get more info. Cool. And some of the key points that we just wanted to reiterate um, is that the day neutrals have the benefits of high yields and a spread out harvest from kind of mid-July until frost. They're really easy to grow. They may not overwinter in Minnesota, so you may have to treat them like annuals. Um, they are typically patent protected, so that's something to keep in mind. You don't want to be propagating these and sharing them with all your friends. Uh, you know, keep the ones that you're growing in the same spot that they're growing, and then you'll be just fine. And then that, that low, providing that low tunnel production uh, can be really beneficial for these. So if we'll pause again for uh, more questions. Before we do that, I just want to um, just to remind everyone that um, the Hort Society has membership uh, packages that you can find on our northerngardener.org um, website. You get a subscription to Northern Gardener Magazine, discounts at garden centers, uh, access to all kinds of gardening webinars, discounts on classes and workshops, um, tickets to the Home and Garden Show, and a monthly newsletter with lots of great info in it as well. Okay, um, before we get to the questions, um, I want to also put in uh, my support for the vacuum in the garden idea. Um, as a very wise woman once told me, the shop vac is for vanquishing our enemies. Um, <laughs> so they work great. Also, there have been uh, a number of people who have suggested their use um, against dandelions for those of you who want them to not be in your garden. Um, if you miss them when they're yellow and they're white and you're afraid that they'll go all over the place, you just use the vacuum cleaner. So um, our first question is from Sandy. Um, are you putting down the landscape fabric and then planting or vice versa? Yes. Yeah, so you put down put the fabric first. <laughs> Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, put down the fabric first um, and then you probably either want to cut or burn holes into it um, and then you can plant into those. Don't want to, you don't want to do it the other way around. It'll be really hard and difficult. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I wish I had a photo of how I just set mine up today, but I literally did it right before the webinar. Um, so I like to, yeah, so put the landscape fabric down and then, and then I just use a pair of scissors and cut a little X where I want to um, plant it. And then, yeah, I just use your planting stick um, and your fingers to put the, the plant in, in the little um, hole that you've cut. Okay, the next question is from Jennifer who wants to know, could the strawberries be grown on a hillside? There's no reason why you couldn't. 
would the drainage necessarily improve or? I would think that the, the drainage would be, you know, um, it would it would be probably good on a hillside in terms of it's a hill. Um, I'd be, you know, it, it it depends on like how steep of a hillside we're talking probably. Um, but there's no reason why you couldn't grow them on a hillside. Yeah. Okay. Um, Pat says they have a backyard with limited gardening space. They're wondering if there is any benefit to planting them in a traditional tiered strawberry bed versus just a regular raised bed. Hmm. Not that Courtney, I can do you know what? Do you yeah. know what they might mean by the the tier, the traditional tiered strawberry bed? I think yes. I do. Yeah, they're thinking of like the awesome. strawberry pot. You know, well, no, it's when you have you have your. Correct me if I'm wrong, Pat. Um, but you have a, a regular raised bed. Yep, Pat says three levels, and then inside that bed you have another raised level. And then inside that you have another raised level. So you kind of have a turret almost, or a, a little tower. Um, they're saying that can be rings or squares. I would think it would work just fine. The 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 ideal is to just have a, a good drained soil that's not gonna get too wet and you want it to, you know, the the moisture to be able to drain away. You don't want it sitting in, in wet soil. Um, so yeah, that should work just fine. And if you're short on space, I mean, you can grow these in containers. Um, mm -hmm. they can be a great container plant. Uh, so if you've got, you know, a three gallon pot, you could put one to two plants in there. Make sure though that you, you know, we, when we plant these out, they've each got, you know, they're, they're one foot apart from each other. So try to maintain, um, that spacing so they can be nice and fruitful. But yeah, I would really consider if you don't have space, um, container gardening too. I once did a really crazy thing where I took a five gallon bucket and it was a really, really wet spring that we couldn't get outside. <laughs> and I took a five gallon bucket and I drilled a whole bunch of holes. Uh, I want to say like 12 to 15 holes around at multiple levels. And then we actually put the strawberries in the buckets kind of in one, one plant per hole um, and tried that. And that worked moderately well. I think we maybe had a few more plants than than our, you know, five gallon bucket of soil could really handle, uh, but it did work. Okay. Um, Susan and Mary both wanted some extra tips for growing in containers. And Mary specifically wants to know, do you still need to mound them or how do you prevent having strawberries in containers lying on the soil? Should you still be using plastic or what? I mean, you um, could take so, and, sorry. No, you go, go ahead. Um, you could take, and if you have some of that landscaping fabric, you know, cut kind of a a, a chunk out that's the same size as the, the top of your container um, and actually kind of lay that, you know, you'd cut a slit in it so you could kind of put it under the plant around um, and have that in there. And that would keep the, the, the water from splashing. It would also keep, um, the, the fruits cleaner would be my suggestion. What do you think, Annie? Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. That's what I was going to say, um, because we know that landscape fabric is going to get you higher yields than straw. So I still wouldn't really recommend um, using straw on a container. But another thing that I've observed is that when you plant these in containers, uh, some of the berries will kind of um, drape off of the container and so they're actually growing in midair over the side of the container and it that's a really lovely way to grow them too so just keep in mind that might happen as well um we have one from abby who wants to know how would you recommend removing the blossoms fingers snips what do you what do you use i just pinch them pinch them with my fingers Okay. Um, Tim wants to know if you can use cardboard under strawberries and containers. Oh yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah, I'd just be a little nervous about them getting enough water. Cause it's gonna have to go through the cardboard. 
future. Right. And Pat has another question. Um, they say containers would be great for keeping the bunnies out, but what about the deer? <laughs> Um, so for deer, I mean, you could construct a little miniature low tunnel, um, over a container, whether we're talking about a pot or whether we're talking about a wooden raised bed, um, you could still construct something over that. You could also just use, um, like a small amount of, you know, two or three foot tall rabbit fencing and surround your container with that. Okay, and Abby wants to know if you grow under plastic, what temperature do you want to maintain? Any thoughts, Annie? <laughs> that is a really scientific question. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I don't have a specific temperature in mind though. Do you, Courtney? I would guess you don't want to bake them. That's for sure. Um, yeah. I would guess you probably want, you know, 75 to 80. You don't really want them up over that. They're not, they don't, I mean, strawberries don't like really, really hot temperatures. They like it mm -hmm. cooler. Um, so you gotta be careful if you're using plastic. That's why that like ventilated plastic is so nice because it, it protects them, but still allows airflow and, and breezes to come through. Um, so I'm gonna guess like 75 to 80 is what you're kind of going for. Okay, and I have a question. So if you're using the plastic, and it's July. Um, is it better to have the bottom of the plastic up or the top of it opened a bit? Or if you have to let some ventilation in, what's the best way to do it? I would pull up the sides if you can. Um, pulling up the sides is probably the easiest way to increase ventilation without, um, you know, opening it up to lots of insects. I mean, part of the reason that the the low tunnels work so well is that the a lot of the bugs are kind of flying over the um, plants, and believe it or not, they are like silly enough that they can't they don't realize that there are plants underneath the low tunnel, um, and so they have a harder time getting to the plants when they're covered by that low tunnel. Um, and so, you know, versus open the, out in the open. So if you can keep the tops of them covered but the sides up and open, you're gonna have better. Uh, better airflow and still have some of the benefit of having that plastic up and over them. Okay, one more. Um, Barbara wants to check, how is it best to water in containers? So um, if you're gonna plant these in containers, you know, drip irrigation, I, you could use drip irrigation in containers for sure, but uh, you can also, I would just use a watering can, um, not the kind that sprinkles, but the kind that just spouts out the water. And I would just put that at the soil surface, not over the plant. Courtney, what would you say? Yep, I would agree. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Courtney and Annie, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. After the webinar is over, uh, you will, which will be in a minute or two, um, you'll receive a survey from us and we would really appreciate it if you would complete it and give us your feedback. Um, you will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours uh, with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. Well, thank you all very much. On behalf of the Minnesota State Horticultural Society and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and stay safe and have fun with your strawberries. Thank Thanks. you.